Hey everybody, Andrew here from Go Green Compost, and boy the cicadas are out in force today. I'm sure you can hear them in the background there. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you 10 edible perennial plants that I'm growing on my Zone 9 North Florida suburban lot. So let's get to the plants. Starting off today with pigeon peas, also known as gondules. This is a pigeon pea that I started earlier this year in the spring, and you can see it's already grown to a pretty good size. And this is basically a shrub-sized gondule. You can prune these to be just about any way you want, and I'll show you some bigger ones I have in just a moment. But these are a really great plant. They're very easy to grow here in Zone 9. They don't require a lot of water or a lot of care. Basically, you just got to prune these things. They're great for providing shade. You can see I've got this one shading this little blackberry that I've got going in this log planter here. And overall, they're just a very easy plant to care for. They provide you with a lot of plant material, so they're good for feeding compost or mulch. And the beans that they produce every spring are great. Also, they're really good for pollinators. In early spring to midsummer, they're gonna be putting up blossoms and the local pollinators here love them. And as you can see, they can also be quite large. Those gondoles in the background there along the fence that are about maybe 15 feet tall now were one of the first plants I planted in my yard. So they've been there for over two years and I've pruned them to be a little bit more like trees so I can have some understory under them. But as you can see, they can get quite large and I'm sure that in the spring, those pigeon peas back there are gonna produce a ton of beans. Next up, I've got this little moringa tree here. And this is a plant that I started only a couple months ago. They're supposed to do really well in Zone 9. There's a Permaculture Jacks Facebook group. And I've noticed that a lot of people on there plant these and seem to have success with them. The cool thing about this plant is the whole tree is edible. So I suspect that by next year or maybe the year after, I'll be able to begin harvesting those leaves. You can grind them up into Moringa powder after you dry them. You may have seen that sold in health food stores. And Moringa is a great source of tons of vitamins. It's got B6, B2. It's a good source of iron. It's also a good source of magnesium. It's also got vitamin A. So lots of good stuff in there. And it also has uh, little bean pods that'll form on it. And you can harvest the seeds. And these are actually the Moringa seeds that I started my Moringa trees from. I just picked these up on Amazon and they're edible. You can eat them. They're supposed to be good for helping keep your blood sugar level steady. They do have kind of an odd flavor, but you can germinate these. All you have to do is soak them and then poke a little hole in the hard outer shell and let them soak for a few days and then they'll start to germinate and you can have your own Moringa trees very easily. Next up, I have an Osage thornless blackberry. And I got this from a nursery at the beginning of the year, kind of in early spring, stuck it in this cloth pot, and it has gotten about 10 times its original size. And these blackberries begin to produce fruit on the second year after the new growth. So the growth that I have on the plant this year should be yielding some blackberries next summer. I haven't seen any yet, but a great thing about this blackberry plant is that it's really easy to propagate. And I've now got several of these growing around my yard just from this one plant. You just take a cutting of green, fresh growth and stick it in some moist sand, give it a week or two and it'll start to develop a root system and then you can plant them and it's very easy to propagate. This is Figgy, my fig tree. Now. When I first planted figgy, I made the mistake of not pruning the tree at all. And when you plant a fig, apparently you need to prune it because the first year it really didn't do much. It just got rust all over the leaves. It lost all its foliage and it didn't have much growth. But then over the winter, I pruned it and this spring it really blew up. Now, I think part of the reason that it's grown so well is that it's getting tons of nutrients from all the compost that I have going around it, but um, also I think that the pruning was crucial to its health. And this year I even got a fig. It does have a little bit of rust right now, kind of in late summer. It's starting to get a little bit of funk, but it's doing much better than it was at this same time last year. And this is peachy, my peach tree. And if you're sensing a theme in the way that we name our trees, all I can tell you is that, that is usually a task that I delegate to my five-year-old daughter. 
Now, this peach tree is a tropic beauty bred specifically for North Florida. It will produce fruit even with the relatively low number of chill hours that we get here. This was the second year we had this tree, and in the spring we had tons of very tasty peaches, and there's been tons of vegetative growth. Almost everything that you see up at the top there is new growth. She's almost doubled in height, I would say, after the pruning that we gave her last winter. And one thing I will say about Peachy is that she responded very well to being pruned. IFIS has a good guide for how to prune your peach tree properly. I would recommend checking that out if you have one of these. And I'll put a link in the description to that and any other resources that I think are pertinent for any of these plants that I mentioned in this video. This is a cayenne pepper, which is in its second year, and in its first year it really didn't produce too much in the way of peppers, uh, but this year it has been producing peppers non-stop since the beginning of spring. So I just come out every uh, week or so and I pull off all the red ripe peppers, and I just harvested the other day, so there's not a lot of ripe ones, but you can see there are definitely some green ones, and those will be ripening up in the next couple days and it even still has new flowers on it, so I think it's going to continue to produce here into late summer and even into the fall. And this guy here is chocolate mint. This, like most mint, is just extremely resilient. I just happen to like the flavor of the chocolate mint, and it seems to do pretty well in my yard. It's very easy to propagate. You can just take cuttings and stick them in water, and they will take root. It also sends out lateral suckers to make new plants, so you can just snip those and plant them in a pot and they'll take very readily. You do wanna keep this chocolate mint and most other mint plants in a container. If you put this in a garden bed, it's gonna take over the whole thing and it's gonna be very difficult to get rid of. But one of the reasons I like to have these around is one, I like to harvest the leaves and make tea out of them. And also it helps to bring in predatory wasps, which help to remove pests from your garden without using pesticide. A lot of people might not realize, but kale can actually be a perennial as well. And this is a lacinato kale plant that I've had for two years now. It was getting really long and spindly, and I actually had a couple more of them. What I did was I just pruned them. I cut the stalk back to basically the point where there was the last bit of uh, vegetative growth. And some of them died, but some of them are actually thriving and continuing to produce more kale so there are definitely plants that if you were in a colder climate or if you were further north you'd only be able to grow them as annuals but here in zone 9 florida some things that might not be perennials elsewhere can actually be grown for an additional year or two and this is my meyer lemon tree as you can see at the moment it's covered in fruit it even has so much fruit that we had to stick those pieces of trellis underneath the branches to support them and keep the fruit off the ground and this thing is just producing a massive number of lemons and they're quite large it's a very very tasty citrus i'm a big fan of the way the meyer lemons taste it is thorny so you have to be a little careful handling it but as you can see it does very well here and it is a heavy producer of fruit and as soon as those ripen up and turn yellow i am excited to harvest them because they are delicious all right, and finally, the 10th perennial I'm growing here on my Zone 9 suburban Florida lot is lemongrass. And as you can see, we have quite a bit of it here along the fence. Now, the cool thing about this lemongrass is this all started from just two small plants, the ones down all the way on the end here. I took cuttings from them and just let them take root in some water, stuck them in the ground, and as you can see, they thrive very readily here. You might occasionally need to water these, and you will need to go in and clean out the old grass and kind of prune them and clean them up every now and then. But other than that, they're extremely low maintenance, and they're very nice for cooking. You can make tea out of them. If you like cocktails, they make a nice vodka infusion. If you want to make a lemon drop martini, stick some lemongrass in your vodka a couple hours ahead of time but there's a lot of practical uses for this stuff. Lemongrass even is a natural mosquito repellent, so I don't really use it in that regard, but you know, if you're standing over in this part of the yard, you don't really notice a ton of mosquitoes either. So that's my final perennial to show you today. All right, everybody, that was 10 edible perennial plants that I grow here in Zone 9 North Florida on my suburban lot. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more videos about edible plants, then check out this one right here. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you next time. Andrew from Go Green Compost, out.